My laboratory uh, applies engineering approaches to understand how metabolism is regulated in the context of disease. Uh, today I'll talk about applications in the area of cancer treatments. I'll focus on that uh, to our work trying to identify new therapeutic targets. And we also ask uh, more broad questions as to, to understand how fat is produced in, in the context of obesity, sleep apnea, and metabolic syndrome. So, make it easier. So, we've known on, on the cancer front, we've known for almost a century that cancer cells exhibit very different metabolism than surrounding tissues. So, this is known as the Borberg effect, uh, and we utilize this for diagnostic purposes uh, in, in the form of FDG PET scans, where you infuse patients with a, a radioactive a glucose analog. And using PET scanning, you, you can see the, the sites of, of tumors and metastases. So this has been effectively translated to, to a great diagnostic tool. But as you'll see, metabolism is much deeper than just glucose uptake by itself. So what we're trying to, what we and others are trying to do is apply uh, these new approaches to understand and exploit uh, specific metabolic dependencies in, in tumor types to, to generate new, new therapeutic targets. Now, you may not have bargained for this, but I find it's useful to give you a little bit of a refresher and some basic biochemistry. So to start, we'll walk through some, uh, some uh, basic uh, central carbon metabolism pathways. So glucose is the main carbohydrate cycling through our bodies. In glycolysis, it, glucose is lysed to two pyruvate molecules. What Vorberg showed is that, that, well, if you're working really hard, you'll use this pathway, of anaerobic glycolysis. What Vorberg showed is that the tumors, even in the presence of adequate oxygen, will undergo aerobic glycolysis and divert much of this pyruvate to lactic acid and we think this occurs to enhance the synthesis of, of nucleotides and DNA. Now, pyruvate can also be metabolized in mitochondria. These are the powerhouses of our cells, and when coupled to respiration, they generate ATP and, and many biosynthetic intermediates within the cell, in particular lipids, as we'll talk about. So over the last couple decades, we've learned that Many oncogenes and tumor suppressors listed in blue, and these are the genes that are mutated or overexpressed and, and play causative roles in tumor genesis, regulate these metabolic pathways. More intriguingly, we've learned that many metabolic enzymes themselves are mutated or differentially expressed in specific tumor types and play a, also play a causative role. Oftentimes, uh, these are loss of function mutations, which will initiate uh, specific metabolic dependencies that we're hoping to target. Of per particular interest, I'm going to focus on our work with isocitrate dehydrogenases, IDH1 and IDH2. Uh, just seven years ago, we, in some sequencing studies, uh, uh, Bert Vogelstein and, and colleagues identified that recurrent mutations in IDH1 or IDH2 <coughs> in a number of different cancers uh, these are fairly common now in acute myeloid leukemia, in some subclasses of brain cancer, 70 to 80 percent of the patients will have mutations in IDH1 or IDH2. These mutations block the normal activity and actually cause these enzymes to make a new metabolite, an oncometabolite, to the D form of 2-hydroxyglutarate, which causes changes in cells to, to prevent differentiation. So. This is, this is all great so far. This is a talk you'd see in a biomedical sciences department. But why, why do we study as engineers? When you're studying metabolism, it's important to look at things in a quantitative manner. So an analogous way is to think about a, a Google map image. We have images like this on my phone in my first year. Uh, this was my commute home. We moved a little bit inland now. Nowadays, we can, with a flick of a switch, we can hit and see traffic and see the fluxes or flow of cars. This information is very useful. We can use this to redirect and come up with a different route, perhaps a more scenic route home, to, to better, better travel. In metabolism, this is no different. We have these wonderful metabolic pathway maps, and we need to understand these 
the way metabolism is functioning in a quantitative manner as we hope to either engineer metabolism for production of some uh, products or reverse engineer it to understand metabolism in the context of disease. So how do we do this? Uh, the goal here is to translate these nice maps into quantitative flux maps and understand how metabolism is operating. We apply mass, mass spectrometry based metabolomics, generates rich data sets to quantify various metabolites in, in a, a cell or, or tissue extract. We also apply, and I'll focus on this for the most part, stable isotope tracers where we can feed cells and, and focus in on one pathway or the next and we couple that to, to mass spec, targeted mass spec based analyses. And finally, we map these these pathways to mathematical representations, stoichiometric matrices to analyze data as, as a system. So how do these experiments work? We feed our cells or, or animals with uh, stable isotope tracers. For example, glucose labeled on all six carbons with a, a stable, with 13C, with heavy isotopes. So the cells, each of these represents carbon atoms, will metabolize this glucose and convert it to, metabolize it in the TCA cycle and convert it to biomass, such as fatty acids. You can then extract those fatty acids and measure labeling on a mass spectrometer. So we can see in this case our glucose carbohydrates are highly used to, to synthesize fatty acids. We can see the number of isotopes on each fatty acid molecule and model this data to quantify the flux of one substrate or another to a given bio, biomass pool. We also do this with amino acids and, and some of our previously published work using glutamine tracers has demonstrated that this reductive pathway, which is operating in the reverse direction of the normal Krebs cycle or TCA cycle, does account for some contribution to fatty acid synthesis. So not only are carbohydrates used for lipid synthesis, but fatty acids are as well. One of the more remarkable findings, if we just, if I present to you some of the modeled data, if we grow cells in a normal tissue culture environment, ambient 21% oxygen, we see glucose and carbohydrates are the main source for lipids. But if we place cells under low oxygen conditions, which actually much more closely mimic the oxygen environments in our body, the cells reprogram their metabolism drastically and actually start using glutamine in this reverse this reductive pathway to fuel virtually all their, the lipids that they, they use to grow. Of note, I like to remind people now the inside of solid tumors is often very hypoxic, more so than what we're even applying here. And it's recently been demonstrated that adipose tissue, the site of fat storage and production, is also often very hypoxic. So one question I'll, I'll, I'll just briefly address is, how do tumors grow when they have mutant IDH enzymes and actually have a compromised pathway, and can we exploit this? So you, we've engineered, we've, in collaboration with Novartis Oncology, we've obtained some engineered cell lines that express either a mutant allele of IDH1, so IDH1 will produce that oncometabolite 2-HG, or IDH2 mutant or wild type enzymes. And what we see here, if we stress the cells and place them under hypoxia, only the IDH1 mutant cells are compromised. So it indicates that this, in the cytosol, this reductive pathway is, is, is catalyzed by IDH1. The, IDH, the, the wild type and IDH2 mutant cells are not really phased by this stress condition. And what our, our, our more broad modeling has indicated is that IDH1 mutant tumors with IDH1 mutations have to rely on other pathways to grow, particularly under, under conditions of, of stress. So what we've done is now tried to exploit that. While they can't use reductive metabolism, they, they rely more on oxidative metabolism. So we treat this panel of cells with an, an inhibitor of mitochondrial metabolism. Rotenone, this is obtained from the leaves of the jicama plants. It significantly increases the doubling time of IDH1 mutant cells. So it increases the doubling time, it decreases the growth rate. 
So this suggests that inhibiting oxidative mitochondrial metabolism may be a, a specific uh, way to target tumor cells with IDH1 mutations in it. So we're applying this, these uh, flux analysis based methods to a number of different systems. I, I gave you one uh, example of a tumor subtype where we're trying to uh, correlate the specific metabolic phenotype of cells with the genotype, mutations in one uh, or another enzyme or tumor suppressor pathway. We're also trying to, in other projects, we're trying to understand the connections between sleep apnea, associated hypoxia, and obesity, metabolic syndrome, and lipid metabolism. We also have other, uh, other projects focusing on understanding pluripotent cell metabolism and metabolism of cardiomyocytes derived uh, from those cells. So with that, I'll thank uh, members of my group, and Seth and Courtney in particular, who did some of this work, and, and the collaborators at Novartis and, and around the country. So thanks for your time, and I'd be happy to take any questions.